Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. God is good, and all the time. Welcome, brothers and sisters, children of God. I hope you had a pleasant day. I had a quiet one, and I thank God for that. The welcome I extend to you, I extend to those watching online, wherever you are. We thank God for technology that allows a man or a woman to speak in a particular spot and to be heard all over the world. We're grateful for that technology, and may the Lord show us more and more how we can use it so that the gospel of Christ may indeed reach every creature under heaven. I hope you're well by God's grace, and I hope your children are even better than you are. Thanks again for coming, and may the Lord bless you. Our subject for this evening, the law of life. What did I say? What was yesterday's message? The Bible can be trusted, yes, and tonight, the law of life. Before I get into that message, let me urge you, as always, in the spirit of reverence, let us make sure that any device we're not using is turned off. I believe this one is. I hope it doesn't surprise me during the service. Uh, favor number two, while I'm speaking, please pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And as surely as God lives, my desire is to speak. Thus saith the Lord, and keep my opinions to myself. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now. Let us do what? Reason, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's reason together. Think God made us rational beings, and that capacity separates us from other living beings animals and birds and whatever else we are rational beings let's use that mind that god has given to us let us pray our father in heaven we thank you so much that through christ we have free access to your presence we come to god in his name now and we ask you first of all if we've sinned against you forgive us dear god Cleanse us, I pray, in the blood of your Son, that powerful, divine detergent. Remove every stain from our characters. Put into our hearts, dear God, a love for righteousness and an intense hatred for sin. We thank you for freedom of worship, and as we bow in your presence, dear God, bless us with your Spirit, that he may open our eyes to understand the words of life. Bless everyone in this building. Bless everyone watching via Facebook or YouTube, whatever the case may be. For those listening who are not Seventh-day Adventists, bless them, dear God, in a very special way, I pray, and a sweet blessing on all the children. Heal anyone, Father, with COVID-19, and for all other aches and ailments, bring relief, I pray, please. Now, God, I commit this service to your glory, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. The law of life. Let us go to Genesis 1. It's five minutes after six. Exactly. I'll release you in good time. Please don't worry. Genesis 1. We read from verse 3. Well, let's read from verse 1. There's a reason why... Genesis 1 1 is where it is because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and so Genesis 1 1 is not accidentally where it is the Spirit of God directed the arrangement of God's Word and so we must look very closely at Genesis 1 1 the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth having said that let's read Colossians 1 verse 16 Colossians 1, verse 16. Our subject, the law of life. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created, 
that are in heaven and that are in earth. And so we have heaven and earth. In Genesis 1, we have heaven and earth in Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. And so we have more details in Colossians 1.16 than we have in Genesis 1.1. But both texts are inseparably connected, visible and and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things verse 17 and by him all things consist one version says all things hold together listen again by him whoever the creator is all things consist all things continue all things hold together all things are maintained let me introduce you or remind you of a principle by which god functions if he makes it he maintains it there are, there's a saying in the united states deadbeat dads they father children, but don't maintain them. God is not a deadbeat dad. Christ is not a deadbeat creator. Let me tell you again a principle by which God functions. If he created it, he maintains it. Go to Hebrews 1. We read from verse 1 of Hebrews 1, our subject, the law of life. Hebrews 1 reading from verse 1 god who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding what all things by the word of his power now we came across all things in colossians 1 16 17 that expression occurs four times three times uh, twice in verse 16 and twice in verse 17. now we have it repeated in hebrews 1 3 upholding all things is the same as by him all things consist in uh, colossians 1 17. And I told you the principle by which God functions among many is, if he makes it, he what? Maintains it. By the way, let me tell you quickly, it's not the sermon, but I'll tell you. There is something called spiritual creation. And the same principle functions. If God creates it spiritually, he maintains it. Let me come down to earth even further. The new birth is spiritual creation when God remakes you that's what the new birth is he doesn't improve you he remakes you then he is obligated finish my words to maintain you that's why you need never fear giving your life to Christ because he who maintains heaven and earth, a universe that cannot be measured by man, he who maintains the universe can maintain you. What God creates, he sustains or maintains or keeps going. If he creates you spiritually, when you give your life to Christ and you converted and born again, God has an obligation to take care of what he creates, whether the creation is spiritual or physical. All right, now, keeping this in mind that God maintains what he creates, let's go back to Genesis 1. What's our subject? The law of life. Mm-hmm. Let's read from verse 26 of Genesis 1. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And verse 27, 
God created man in his own image after his likeness. Humanity was made by God. We said the principle is what God, come on, uh-huh, he maintains. Who created Adam? God. Then what is God obligated to do? Maintain him. But how does God maintain whether it's a human being, a tree, a fish, a bird, a star, a river, or a rock? Let's go to Genesis 2. We'll read from 7, get some connection. Genesis 2, let's read from verse 7. Are you there? Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, grant me the words. Grant me your spirit. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Verse 7, Genesis 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became what? A living soul. Now, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Listen to Psalm 33, 6 and 9. Oh, you may go there with me. Psalm 33, 6 and 9. Keep in mind, we just read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Psalm 33, 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Now let's look at those two statements. By the what? Word of the Lord were the heavens made. That's one statement. Look at the other statement. What does it say? And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Based on those two statements, the first one says, by the word of the Lord. How does the second one begin or end? By the breath of his mouth. What does that tell you? What is the breath of God's mouth? His word. Mm -hmm. The breath of his mouth is just a colorful way to say his word. Look at verse 9. For he spake, and it was done. Come on. He commanded. And so in verse 6, we have word of the Lord. In verse 9, he spake. In verse 9, commanded. Three times we have God speaking only once the breath of his mouth. Therefore, we must lean on the three more than the one in trying to explain the verse. Are you following me? Now, I didn't say it clearly enough. Let me try again. There are principles to study the Bible. When you follow them, the Bible comes alive. We're looking at three, uh, Psalm 33, 6 and 9. 6 says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. And so we have word of the Lord, breath of his mouth. What does that mean? Verse 9 explains it. For he spake. That goes with words. And it was done. He commanded. And it's so fast. We have spake, commanded, word. Three. And we only have breath of his mouth once. Breath of his mouth simply means the word of God. Are you following me? All right. Now, Adam was made, you know, Ellen White said, as the word that bade the first man live still gives us life. Desire of Ages, page 320, I believe, paragraph 2. As the word of God, which bade or commanded the first man to live, still gives us life. And so she tells us Adam received life by the word of God. God spoke it. As verily as he spoke life to whom? In John 11, standing outside that tomb, to whom did he speak life? Lazarus. He simply said, Lazarus, come forth by the word of God. And I'm trying to answer the question, how now does God maintain, sustain, and carry along what he has created? Let's continue reading Genesis 2. We go to verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, how did God make the tree to grow out of the ground? His word. Go to verse 11 of chapter 1. 
verse 11 of chapter 1 of Genesis. Are you there? Not yet. Just the previous chapter. All right. Read with me. And God said what? Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. How did God bring about vegetation? By his word. Now let's go to verse 9 of chapter 2. Are you there? And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. How did God do that? By his word. But listen more closely. Not only did he create it by his word, he kept the trees growing, finish my words, by his word. Reason with me. When God made Adam... Was Adam a child or an adult? An adult. Now, six days to create. Adam was made on the sixth day. When God made trees in verse 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12, were they seedlings or fully grown trees? Fully grown trees because three days later, hungry human beings were coming into the earth. Are you with me? They could not wait years for fruit trees to grow. God made adult trees providing fruit already uh, ripe and ready to be plucked and eaten. All of this by the word of God. All right. Let's go to verse 16 now. Are you at verse 16 of chapter 2? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, finish the verse, thou shalt surely die. But when God said thou shalt surely die, what was included under thou shalt surely die? Let's get a clue by going back to verse 26 of Genesis 1. Read with me. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. When God made Adam, God gave Adam dominion over what? The entire earth, and everything on the earth was placed under him. It's important to consider that. Now, Let's see what happened when Adam sinned. Go to chapter 3. Let's read verse 17 of Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 17, our subject, the law of life. Are you there? And unto Adam he said, you may read with me if you so choose, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Keep reading. Cursed. Yes. What part of the ground? Just the ground in the garden? What ground? The whole earth. Now, let's reason again. Go back now to Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, finish the verse, thou shalt surely die. Now, but not only would Adam die, what would also die? Everything under his dominion. That's reasoning through the scriptures. Everything under his dominion. How do we know that? Look at verse 18 of Genesis 3. What does that say? Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. The trees felt the curse. Let me say it again. When God said, thou shalt surely die, it included everything under Adam's dominion. When he sinned, everything was touched and affected by sin. That is why God has to come back and make what? A new earth. Not just a new garden. He has to make a new earth. Because when Adam sinned, the entire world was corrupted by sin. Now... Now let's go back to Genesis 2, 16, 17. I hope I'm not confusing you in any way, but I want you to think. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Question for you. What did God tell Adam would lead to death? Give me one word. Disobedience. Hmm. So we have two words. We have disobedience. What else do we have? You just said it. We have disobedience and death. I have to be certain you're getting this. We have disobedience, which leads to death. God said, in the day you eat, or in the day you disobey me, you will die, and everything under you. Now I said, what God creates, he maintains. What is the only thing that can interfere with God's maintenance of creation? Sin. Sin. Whether maintaining a tree, a fish, a bird, a human being, sin. The only interruption, the only thing that hinders God's maintenance of his creation is sin. And so God said, if you eat, which is if you disobey, which is if you sin, you will die. Creation will die with you. If this is the case, let's take death and what? Or disobedience and? Come on, you say it again. Disobedience and? Let's turn that around. Let's flip that coin. What do we have? Obedience and? Yes. What is the principle of God's maintaining creation? Obedience. To what? His law. Obedience to his law is the means whereby God maintains every level of creation. I... Uh, We'll take you to Genesis 1-3. Go back to Genesis 1-3. Our subject is the law of life. And I hope someone has said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I need God's words. Or someone online has already offered that prayer on my behalf. Genesis 1 verse 3. Now I want you to read microscopically. Are you there? And God said, what? Let there be light. Stop. What did God say? How many words? Four. Keep one finger on Genesis 1-3. Take another finger to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. Second Corinthians 4 verse 6. All right, one person has it. I'll wait a few seconds for the others. All right, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Read with me if you have my version. For God, who did what? Commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. Now pause. Pause. Read that verse again for me, or the part we just read. You read it for me. For God, who? commanded the light to shine out of darkness now keep this in mind God commanded the light now listen and God said let there be light let there be light was what four words that made up a command how did light come by command then how is light maintained <laughs> by command Let me tell you point blank in case you fall asleep sometime in this sermon. Everything that exists that God created is maintained by law. You right now, you're breathing. There are laws that govern how the oxygen you take in moves from the lungs to the blood there are physical laws that govern that if those laws break down what happens you die there are laws that govern the transfer of carbon dioxide from the blood to the lungs and out into the atmosphere if those laws broke down we die 
There are laws that govern the flow of blood in the various uh, vascul in the vascular system. There are laws that govern that. We all walk or run sometimes. If you're walking, if certain muscles don't work, you would fall forward. If you're jogging or running, if certain muscles back here don't work, you would fall flat on your face. I travel a lot by God's grace. I'm always in planes. And I thank God a plane moving through the air is doing so because certain laws of aerodynamics are functioning. If those laws cease, that plane would follow another law, the law of gravity, and would come crashing down. There's a reason why the front part of the wing of a plane is different from the back part. The front part is bigger than the back part. It has to do with the law of a fluid moving over an object. The top of the wing is slight sh sl shaped slightly differently from the bottom. So that certain pressures, high on one point, low on the other, may function to keep that plane in the air. I thank God that there are laws that allow a plane to fly. You see, in, when a plane flies, there's something called friction trying to hold it back. The plane has to overcome friction. When a plane rises, there's something trying to pull it down. It's called gravity. The plane has to overcome that. So it must overcome drag. It must overcome gravity. All these laws must function so I can get from Detroit to Manila in the Philippines. What am I trying to tell you? There is nothing in creation that is not affected by law. What's our subject? The law of life. Now listen again to what God said to Adam. Of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But you go and read that first, the first few words of that verse for me. Genesis 2 verse 16. Read the first few words. Ah, stop. <laughs> the Lord God commanded. Now, if Adam had obeyed that command, would he have continued to live forever? Yes. So obedience then is life. As verily as disobedience is death, obedience is life. And so the Bible teaches us very early, as early as chapter 2, if you desire to live in God's system, you must, come on, tell me, obey. Whether you're a man or fish or a bird or a horse. Or grass. Ladies, I don't mean to pick on the ladies, but I'm sure you have plants in your house. Do you put the plants where they can get no sunlight? <laughs> Is that where you put your plants? <laughs> there are laws that require a plant to come in contact with sunlight. The most fundamental process on earth, perhaps, is a process called, and you scientists can correct me, uh, photosynthesis. In order for that process to take place, it must follow certain laws. That's why you and I can breathe oxygen because the plants give that off. As the scientists call it, a byproduct. Well, I love that byproduct. The law of life. Disobedience brought death. Obedience preserves life. God created by law. And the Lord God commanded the light. Let there be light, the Bible tells us, was a law. It was a command. And the light that came by command is preserved by command. And people who were made by command. And the God spoke. As verily as he made Lazarus, he brought him to life by his words. We are preserved by precisely what made us when God made our first human beings, first parents. That is the command of God. If the entire universe runs by command, follow me closely, in order to fit in to the universe, what kind of life should we live? Come on, tell me. An obedient life. A disobedient person is out of step with the entire universe. 
And a disobedient person is a threat to God's kingdom. Are you following me? You may think I am one person, the universe is so vast. One disobedient person constitutes a threat to God's universal kingdom. Lucifer sinned, took angels with him. On the earth, Adam sinned, and the whole world was affected by the sin of one man. And so the Bible says in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. The act of one man, and it was one act. A whole world began to go down the slope towards death. Jesus came mm -hmm. to reverse that. You see, it was he who said, let there be light. We found that out last night. Are you with me? It was he who said, let there be light. It was Christ who said, let the earth bring forth grass. It was Christ who said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. And the living creatures came. It was Christ who created angels by his word. Psalm 148 verses 1, 2, and 5. It was by the word of Christ. Because he is the creator. Now his creation has gone off the rails. He has come to deliver the creation from the disobedience of death. Finish my words. Come on, think. From the disobedience of death to the obedience of life. Now, go to Romans 5. Romans 5. Let's read verse 19. And I want you to read that verse as though Christ himself is speaking to you. Romans 5, let's read verse 19. Do you have that? Read with me. What does that say? For as by one man's disobedience, come on, many were made. Yes, go on. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous now. Listen again. We have obedience, sinners. Obedience, righteous. I'm asking you to read with me so you know I'm reading from the Word of God. Listen again. For as by one man's, who is that one man? Adam. One man's disobedience. And God told him, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous now. What's our subject? The law of life. Many will be made righteous. We need to look at the word righteous and see what it means. Now, to help us with that, let's go one step further into Romans chapter 6. Think with me, think with me, beloved of God. Think. It makes you young when you think. So think. Do you have Romans 6? We read verse 16. But let me pray again. Father, give me simple language and give comprehension to your people whom you love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Romans 6, 16. Are you there? Read with me. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Stop. Here's God. Here's the Creator. Here's Satan. To whom did Adam yield himself? Satan. By doing what? Disobeying. I want that word disobey and obey. By disobedience, he yielded himself. Listen to the verse. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, which means you cannot be forced to sin. It's a choice. You can choose to die and not sin. A young man wrote me a few weeks ago. Because of poverty, my mother was forced into prostitution. I didn't say anything to him, but I said to myself, no one can force you into prostitution. No one can force you into bank robbery. No one can force you into hijacking a car. Sin is a choice. Flip that coin. Righteousness is a choice. Now, listen again. Romans 6.16. Know ye not. That to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servant ye are to whom ye obey. Finish the verse now. Whether of? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Obedience unto? Now, 
we have sin unto obedience unto and I've talked about that so many times because it's such a central and important theme whether of sin unto death obedience unto righteousness now what is righteousness think listen again whether of sin uh -huh, unto obedience unto what is righteousness life life righteousness is life sin free life now listen again to Romans 5 19 for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made or alive and so Ephesians 2 verse 1 you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin to quicken is to make alive until you know Jesus Christ you are not alive which means that salvation has a condition in one word give me that condition obedience now, I'm not saying you can't obey your way to heaven. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying there is a condition upon which God saves. There's a condition upon which someone is lost. What's that condition? Disobedience. What's the condition upon which one is saved? Obedience. Our subject is the law of life. The law of life is obedience. young man wrote me today hadn't heard from him in a week's nice fellow and uh, told me his life is going badly he's drifting from God I have been counseling for decades and I always always meet people Christians who when things go badly they start drifting from God I've never met someone who, when things go badly, decides to drift from Satan. Never. Things go wrong, stop going to church. Stop praying. Stop studying the word of God. We stop these things when things go wrong. I have never met anyone in my long life who's ever said, ah, things are going badly in my life. Let me drift from Satan. We always drift from God. young man wrote me my life is in chaos what's wrong with God doesn't he see I'm leaving him that's what he wrote me I'm going to become a Muslim this is what he wrote me then he wrote the next day I apologize to God he was apologized for God he said I was in a moment of insanity and I apologize to God and of course God forgives like that my listening friend wherever you are in the building online the law of life is obedience obedience is life I'll tell you something else obedience is righteousness and righteousness is a lifestyle and the lifestyle that God requires is a lifestyle in which thus saith the Lord becomes the principle by which we do how many things everything obey God Christ came and gave us an example of obeying God in every single thing. And so he could say of his life in John 8, 29, And he that have sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. This is the life God wants. Jesus Christ came to deliver us from the disobedience of death. To the obedience of life the angel told Gabriel not Gabriel the angel Gabriel told Joseph in a dream and she shall bring forth a son and thou shall call his name what Jesus why for he shall save his people come on from this sins now you tell me what is sin the transgression of the law now keep this in mind and let's have the spoken English for he shall save his people from disobeying God's law
salvation delivers a man or a woman from opposition to God's law. This is not legalism. This is simply a different way of explaining to you and to me what Christ did at Calvary. He, Calvary is the power to live a life of obedience to God. It is not difficult. Go to Revelation 22, then I'll close. The last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. Mm -hmm. Written by the same one who wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote five books. John and the three epistles, then Revelation. He was the youngest of the twelve disciples. He was closest to Christ. Read verse 14 with me of Revelation 22. What does that say? Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to what? The tree of life. Stop. What do you understand by do his commandments? Obey. That gives you a right to what? So what do we have? Obey and life. In the very last chapter of the Bible, God connects obedience with life. The very way, in the opening chapters, we have disobedience and death. The Bible closes with obedience and life. Question for you, but don't answer me. Is there an area in our lives where we are deliberately disobedient to God? Don't answer me. My purpose today was to let you see that what God requires of you of, and me is obedience to his law. This is how a saved person lives. When God met, met Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, Saul said what you and I must all say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? When Paul was in prison in Philippi, Acts 16, the jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The rich young ruler, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Not one of them said, what must I do to save myself? What must I do to be saved by someone else? And the condition is, obey God. Someone may say, well, no, we're saved by faith. Wait a minute. Go to 1 John chapter 3, quickly. 1 John chapter 3. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But we must not have a, a half-dead view of faith. In order for faith to live, there must be obedience. Without works, which is obedience, there is no faith. 1 John chapter 3. Let's read verse 23 carefully. Do you have that? All right. Read with me. What does it say? And this is his what? Stop. This is his commandment. A commandment is not a suggestion. It's not just a good idea. You either obey, you disobey. You're not to discuss it and decide, well, let me modify. This is his commandment. Keep reading. That we should believe now. Give me another word for belief. Faith. <laughs> this is his commandment commandment that we should believe so we are commanded to believe we have faith and command you can't remove obedience from any aspect of salvation because if christ had not obeyed the father there would have been no salvation did i say that clearly let me repeat my words you cannot remove obedience from any aspect of salvation if jesus christ had not obeyed the father there would have been no salvation and so the bible says for this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son jesus christ we are commanded to believe we're not forced we're commanded so when you believe you have obeyed ah you didn't get it my fault my fault Always my fault. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. No. Listen to you as you read. Read 1 John 3, 23. Pause, pause. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes, dear God. Open our eyes and help me to make it simple. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read it for me. 1 John 3, 23. Yes, 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 my lovely sister. Yes. That's long overdue. All right. Read 1 John 3, 23 for me. Come on, read. I'm listening to you. This is his commandment. Now, when God gives a command, what does he want? Give me one word. Obedience. Mm -hmm. Now,
Mm -hmm. Now, stop. What are we commanded to do? Believe. Now, God can't force you. What was Adam commanded not to do? Not to eat of that tree. God gives the command. The response is up to us. This is his commandment that we should believe. Which means when you believe, you have. Yeah, that's true, but that's not what I want. Listen to me. Listen, listen. Uh, am I being too hard on you? All right. Read the line again. Come on, read so I can hear you. This is his commandment. Okay, stop. I ask you, when God gives a command, what does he want? All right. This is his commandment that we should do what? Or, or believe. When we believe, what have we done? We've obeyed. Salvation is based on obedience. Damnation is based on a condition, which is disobedience. Not one obedient person will end up in hell. Not one disobedient person will end up in heaven. You choose the law of life. Give me one word for the law of life. One word. Give me one word for the law of death. How many choose the law of life? Ah, uh, God bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. If I spoke badly, forgive me, dear God. Let your spirit magnify what I've tried to say. The law of life is obedience. If Christ had not obeyed you, dear God, there would have been no salvation. There would have been no death if Adam had obeyed you. As verily as sin leads to death and sin is disobedience, obedience is life, dear God. You are a God who maintains what you create. And your maintenance is similar to creation. You create by command. You maintain by command. You require us to obey. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear God, remind us in all that we do, we live in a universe created by command. And that you require of us obedience to thus saith the Lord in every area of our lives. We thank you for Christ. And his obedient life, he obeyed you in all that he did. And he is an example for us, meaning that through his power, you and I can live an obedient life. Uh, we, sorry, can live an obedient life. Give us that power, dear God. And that power is the very obedient life of Christ. Give us that power that our lives may glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.